Greetings and salutations. Welcome to the fifth installment of the 21st year of demystifying medicine. I'm Dan Kastner. I am the scientific director emeritus and still a senior investigator in the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I'm here uh, uh, replacing for the moment uh, Wynn Arias, who couldn't be here this week. He's away. Recording uh, in progress. And uh, I will be your host uh, for this afternoon. And of course, as many of you know, this is a wonderful series that Dr. Arias uh, has put together over the last 21 years that uh, attempts and succeeds in building bridges uh, between the exciting developments of biology and engineering uh, with medicine. These sessions go on uh, from the beginning of January, January 4th, through the 3rd of May, with the final installment, I believe, being uh, our good friend, Dr. Francis Collins, who will be uh, uh, finishing up uh, the series on May the 3rd. Uh, it is videocast, so for those of you who are not available uh, at uh, 4 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, you can view the videocast uh, afterwards or, or view it live uh, uh, between 4 and 6. The course schedule, uh, the, the website for that is listed on this slide. And those of you uh, who attend at least 50% of the sessions and pass a final examination, a very, very tough final examination, will receive a CME certificate. Uh, I believe that you'll need to know the CME uh, number, uh, so please do take it down. It is 38645. It's different each time. So if you wrote it down the last time, it's not the same uh, this time. Uh, if you have questions during the course of the presentations, uh, you should use the send live feedback option on the video cast display. And you can do that as you think of the question. And the questions will be tabulated by one of uh, our colleagues uh, here, and then uh, uh, given to me uh, towards the end of the presentation. We'll have questions and answers at the end of the, uh, the two presentations. All of the previous sessions, going back the full 21 years, uh, are available uh, at the website shown here on this slide. And for additional information, uh, you can email uh, the good Dr. Arias, uh, who will be able to answer your questions, I think. So if we can have the next slide, uh, we can see the iconic Brooklyn Bridge uh, at the time that it was uh, being constructed. And this is actually a photo taken with a box camera uh, by Dr. Arias's uh, grandfather back uh, a few years ago. And you can see on the catwalk to the left uh, that there are a couple of guys standing there just casually having a conversation with one another. Uh, and the whole idea here is that by building bridges, we are able to get people to talk to one another and to exchange ideas. And especially now, given the uh, magnitude and the complexity of information that one needs to master in clinical medicine, and similarly, the magnitude and complexity of information that one needs in the basic sciences, it really is too much all to be in one head. And so building bridges and having people talking to one another, that's what's really important. That's what we want to stimulate today uh, so that people get thinking about how to, to make those connections between basic science and clinical medicine. So if we can have the next slide, you will then see the uh, program that we have in store for you this afternoon, and it is a doozy. So the title is Defining Genes Underlying Mendelian Immunological Disorders Leads to Precision Medicine Interventions. And we have two stellar presenters. Uh, the first uh, presenter will be Dr. Mike Leonardo of the Laboratory of Immune Systems Biology in the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He is the chief of the molecular development of the immune system section. He's the co-director of the NIAID Clinical Genomics Program and co-founder of a whole bunch of things. I just wrote down a few of them on this slide, the NIH Oxford Cambridge Research Scholars Program, the NIH University of Pennsylvania Immunology Program, the NIH National MD PhD Partnership Program, 
a number of different, uh, very important initiatives that he has been the, uh, the leader of. He's uh, a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. And if you go to his website, you will find a veritable alphabet soup of different uh, disease genes and new diseases that he's discovered over the course of his uh, stellar career uh, at the NIH. And just three of them uh, from the website that are listed here include the autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome or ALPS uh, with mutations in several different genes associated with that, the X-linked immunodeficiency disease with magnesium defect, Epstein-Barr virus infection and neoplasia, or X-Men uh, uh, disease, and the P110 delta activating mutation causing senescent T-cells, lymphadenopathy, and immunodeficiency disease, or PASLI. And, and there are others, and in fact, you will hear about another, at least one other that I know of, uh, in his presentation coming up after uh, this introduction. If we can have the next slide, you will then see our second presenter, also, uh, a stellar uh, presenter, Dr. Helen Su from the Laboratory of Clinical Immunology and Microbiology in the NIAID. She is the chief of the Human Immunological Diseases section there, has an MD and PhD from Brown University, uh, trained in pediatrics at WashU, uh, and then allergy and immunology uh, in NIAID at the NIH. She too has a, a, a veritable alphabet soup of uh, acronyms on her website uh, as well, uh, with, uh, for example, DOC8 deficiency and cytothripsis. For those of you who don't know what that is, maybe we will find out uh, during the course of the presentation. MDA5 deficiency and susceptibility to the common cold. CD70 deficiency and increased risk of EBV infection and EBV-related cancer. And genetic susceptibility to severe SARS-CoV-2 infection. So I'm sure that uh, uh, Dr. Leonardo and Dr. Sue will pick something really interesting, a combination of really interesting things to tell us about. And without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Leonardo. Mike, take it away. Uh, you're muted. We still can't hear you. How about now? Indeed, we can hear you loud and clear. Great, very good, thanks. Okay, all right, so Dan, thank you so much for your very generous uh, introduction and thank you, uh, Dan and Dr. Arias and your whole team uh, for having me back. I, I looked back at my schedule. And the last time I was here uh, for this talk was in 2013. So it's been quite a while. But it's one of my favorites of all the lectureships at NIH because of its tremendous importance uh, for medical research and advancements in, in medical care. So as Dan mentioned, I'm going to talk about the molecular definition of congenital immune defects in the pathogenesis diagnosis and treatment leading to new treatment concepts. And uh, I want to just mention, this is a good pairing with Dr. Sue, uh, because in fact, we run the program sort of jointly together, uh, the clinical genomics program. And um, she's been a great colleague and uh, given me a great appreciation for areas of medicine that I don't, uh, that I didn't know about myself. So uh, first, let me just say I have no conflicts to declare. I will discuss off-label use of a drug called ecolizumab, which is uh, it's trade name is Solaris, and it's marketed by Alexion, but I have no connection to the company. So the learning objectives are, first of all, to learn how contemporary human Mendelian genetics can be used to define new diseases, leading to improved diagnosis and treatment. And of course, Dr. Castor himself is, is uh, one of the, the leaders in the field at doing this. Uh, learn how overactive complement can damage intestinal lymphatics and cause protein-losing enteropathy. And finally, learn how a specific molecular etiology of a disease, when it's determined, can uh, yield precision medicine therapies uh, that are highly successful. So I want to just start and talk about how human research in general, but more specifically, human genetics research has changed. 
And this has been such a dramatic uh, 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 transformation just in, in my lifetime in science. Uh, I recall very clearly as a college student being in labs, uh, working on uh, enzymology and, and other sort of biochemically oriented scientists. I also worked in a, in a genetics lab and how in general, the idea of doing clinical research was considered that you would be doing something soft and not very rigorous and certainly no, no match for all the beautiful model systems, whether it be in genetic systems in bacteria or in uh, uh, flies or, or yeast. Uh, it really was felt that to do clinical research was consigning yourself to, 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 to never doing a rigorous experiment. And I think the thing that has really transformed human medical research uh, has been the huge influx of new technologies. And there's no way even on one slide I could list all of the transformative technologies, but I just wanna mention a few that will have influenced the research I'm gonna to talk to you about today uh, and, and have had a huge impact on genetic research in human beings. And that is, uh, first of all, of course, the, the enormously powerful next-gen DNA sequencing uh, technologies, whole exome sequence, or more, more frequently now, whole genome sequence, but also things like high-efficiency transfection, where you can put DNA constructs into a human cell and interrogate what effects uh, uh, different uh, alterations of the genes have on their impact in the cell. Uh, also, the use of induced pluripotent stem cells. As immunologists, we're very fortunate in that we can take peripheral blood and get a hold of the cells of interest. But if you're thinking about working on the brain or the heart or other tissues where it's not so easy to sample from a living human being uh, those tissues, uh, now we have these amazing pluripotent stem cells that can be differentiated into the, the tissues of interest and, and, and studied very carefully and rigorously in vitro. Uh, of course, everyone has heard about uh, uh, CRISPR technology, uh, maybe less well known as uh, interfering RNAs. Both of them are very useful in the lab for shutting off genes and asking or modifying genes and asking what happens when you in, engineer the genome in those ways. And, and finally, and, and I think this is often overlooked, but incredibly uh, important, given the fact that I'm, I'm speaking to you over a laptop at this moment, is desktop computing power. So the ability to interrogate a genome using something that slips into your briefcase uh, and, and can connect you to the world's literature is really transformative in ways that when I was a student could, could never have been imagined. So most of the genomic research that has been done up until now uh, 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 at least up until the last few years, was uh, a way of interrogating the whole genome called genome-wide association studies. And what these do is they use common variants in the genome to ask how do these assort when you look at specific disease states and compare, say, individuals with a particular disease phenotype to a so-called normal population. And, uh, and, and we specifically chose not to use that approach and really focus on Mendelian traits. And in the graph on the left-hand lower side there, the, the kind of colorful uh, big thing that looks like a gigantic pedigree, um, it's sort of a reverse pedigree actually. And, and it, it, it really explains why we chose to do that. And that comes from a review by Jim Lupsky in which he talks about where mutations come from and how do they exist in the population. Specifically, new mutations are born generally in one individual, often in one, one ovum or one sperm. And, and, and they occur uh, oftentimes during meiosis and, and then get carried into the, the, the germ, uh, in, 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 into the, the zygote, and then are, uh, affect the phenotype in various ways. If they are very severe, then oftentimes they may never become Mendelian in the sense that they are never transmitted. The person is too sick or dies too early uh, before sexual maturity. But, but if they are, are compatible with reproduction, then they may impair reproduction to various extents, and that will determine how far in the population you get, uh, whether you're in the red zone or get up to the yellow zone or the green zone. And, and, and so that's very different from interrogating widespread polymorphisms, which is done uh, in GWAS studies, 
because those are gonna be out in the, in, in the blue zone. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, I'm just gonna kind of circle around here a little bit so you can see way out there. So those have undergone a process that we call purification by selection, meaning that they have not impacted reproduction enough so that they stay in the population. And so by definition, in a way from a geneticist standpoint, they're gonna have a very small effect on phenotype with exceptions, some exceptions, uh, but, but in general, that will be true. And, and that's exactly what has been found. We can find many, many variants that are associated with different, for example, autoimmune diseases, but they have very little impact. By contrast, the kinds of lesions that we study, which are just in one small family, uh, 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 which are down here in the red zone, uh, uh, usually have very, very severe impact. And that's why they haven't spread throughout the population. So those are the things that are most intensely uh, uh, interesting to us because they have a big effect on phenotype. And therefore we're dealing with a very severe disease and we're trying to understand why those genes have those pathogenetic effects. So if you summarize all this uh, and look at all the different possibilities, you can see that typically uh, these uh, 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 Mendelian alleles that have a very high penetrance, very high effect on phenotype are way out here, uh, uh, are way down here, I should say, in the very rare allele frequency because they cannot be carried through the population. Whereas the variants identified by GWAS are much more common because that's what GWAS studies look at. And, and, and because of that, they have a very low, uh, generally speaking, a low, low impact on phenotype. Again, there are exceptions I won't get into. I'm happy to take questions at the end. And then, of course, there's some other possible categories, uh, but that's not usually what we what we deal with. So, um, so in general, that's why we we do the research uh, that we do. So, how do you do this? Well, it turns out it's it's pretty complicated uh, because. One of the things that we've learned from a lot of sequencing now of human genomes and actually many other species is that there are far more variants in the human genome than classical genetics would ever have predicted. And, and, and what I mean by that is there's just variants in all sorts of different genes so that any given individual you pick, you're gonna find deviations from what's called the reference sequence. And, and one of the things that Lupsky points out in his review from which I lifted that, that beautiful diagram is that in fact, when you start to get beyond the nuclear family, that is your parents, your siblings and, and, and your children, uh, you begin to pick up a lot of variations that are brought into the genomes of different people. So he talks about clan genomics, there being only your clan having very, very close a genetic relationship to you. So that poses a problem because when you're comparing a sick individual, a very rare individual, maybe only a few people with a disorder to the reference genome, there may be a lot of different variants and you're trying to look for a common variant. And if you only have one patient, that could be very difficult to, to, to isolate. So that requires what I call the virtuous circle of discovery and, and the participation of a lot of different people with very different skills. So it starts, of course, with the clinical workup where a skilled clinician can really identify what the problems are that the patient is suffering from. And then we try to get down, since these are immunological diseases, get down to what is wrong with cells, if possible, in the immune system. What, what's going wrong? Where's the locus, the cellular locus of the abnormality? We then, of course, submit uh, samples to uh, whole exome or whole genome sequencing to, to get the basic genetic information from that individual and then carry out the computer analysis. And I think originally, when people first started doing whole exomes and whole genomes, people were just sequencing a lot of random patients, thinking that they would just plug it into the computer based on classical genetic idea of you know, the genome being mostly normal, i.e. the reference sequence. And, and, and trying to find genes uh, that are abnormal. And, and, and that really doesn't work in, in, in many cases, partly because there's so many variants in the coding sequences, partly because the non-coding sequences have not been annotated in a medically useful way yet. So therefore, um, the computational analysis is, is important and has to be done, but oftentimes it, in and of itself is, is quite limited. 
So that leads to then a whole process of gene validation where the, the patient and the genome is assigned to a researcher in the laboratory who then begins to take apart the cellular defect, uh, interrogate different genes that look like they're su suspects for being the causative uh, a gene variant, and then and, 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 and tries to really validate a particular candidate. And that then goes into a pathway study so that you can really begin to understand the molecular underpinnings of disease. And, and um, if that is all successful, then that leads to two very good outcomes, uh, the first of which being going back to the family and saying, hey, we understand uh, what's going wrong now. And, and I was really impressed. You know, I really got into this business um, uh, uh, back in the 90s with a brilliant clinician who's uh, sadly no longer with us, Steve Strauss. And I was so impressed when Steve would explain to the family that we've identified a gene and, and, and what it meant for the, for the uh, uh, health of the child. It was so remarkable how just that information alone was incredibly important and valuable to the family. M many times these families had been uh, to many different medical centers, no one really knowing what was wrong. And just having now a specific idea of what it was, a specific gene, was, was so very important. And the other uh, great uh, potential outcome is that the pathway can yield points of intervention. And I'll show an example of that in our, in our case study today, of where you can intervene and hopefully uh, counteract the negative manifestations of disease. And then, of course, that leads back to the completion of the circle and another, another sick uh, child is, is in investigated. And on the right, it just shows in order to do this the most successfully that we could, given that we have so many different uh, uh, talented investigators, talented clinicians across the NIH campus, is to bring them together. And that led to the creation of the NIAID Clinical Genomics Program. Uh, Helen uh, has been one of the architects of this, a number of people in the Institute. Uh, Steve Holland has helped us build it out with the Central Sequencing Initiative and, uh, and was one of the original organizers with Jeff Cohen, Cohen and, and uh, uh, Dean Metcalf and others. And, and and it's a little bit of a misnomer in that it's not strictly limited to NIAID, but brings together people with interests in uh, genetic d diseases of the immune system. And when you bring that group of people together to talk about cases, which we try to do every Tuesday, uh, you get a lot of great ideas and insights on, uh, first of all, how to investigate the disease, secondly, how to really pinpoint the uh, genetic lesion, and finally, uh, what kinds of treatments would be would, would, would be useful. So it's been a really great adventure. It's been in existence for over a decade now, uh, and, and has been really a lot of fun. One of the things uh, that um, uh, uh, really has helped push this forward was uh, something, again, that goes back to the idea of how important computers are to this kind of research. And so initially, when we started the program and started generating a lot of sequence, we looked around and thought, for sure, somebody's got to have a great system already built that we can just buy and do, uh, do this kind of genomic research. And we found out that that wasn't the case, that actually people had bits and pieces of different systems that, that could work, but... Um, but uh, nobody really had a, a system. And, and one of the, the key players who was actually the deputy of the clinical genomics program for a number of years before he, he moved up to greater, greater things at Columbia University, Josh Milner, uh, uh, took it, uh, uh, the assignment on it of helping to try to build a computer system that would integrate clinical information, clinical laboratory information, uh, phenotypic and de demographic information about the patients with their pedigree with their, their genomic information. And so luckily, uh, uh, the computer, computational group in, uh, 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 in BCIBB and Mike Taratovsky and a number of others bought into this. And we were so fortunate to have uh, Sandhya Zirasegar assigned to lead this effort that she's done for a number of years now to build what we now call the Genomic Research Integration System, or GRIS. Uh, which is now being exported out of NIAID to other institutes at NIH. But it's just a fabulous system based on the two key um, tools made by the Broad Institute, Phenotips and Seeker, and now it's actually Seeker 2.0, uh, to, to put this information together with a very beautiful uh, graphical user interface. And this allows us to really uh, go 
go into these diseases in very um, uh, 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 important ways. And, and, and it's really um, bolstered by using the human phenotype autogeny. And, and uh, Morgan Similak and Magda Wakovich and their colleagues have really gotten involved in this and helping to, to build that part of the program out. So anyway, I just wanted to, to say that um, this is a very useful system. And if, if, uh, if uh, we can help you with it, um, I think that would be very, very good. But it's really the underpinning of the clinical genomics program. So the next slide introduces a disease uh, that we became aware of in uh, about 2016, uh, in which um, we were referred patients because they uh, had recurrent infections. And as you can see over in this plot in the upper left-hand side, when we uh, just did a blood analysis of these patients, uh, and initially I think there was really only one family, uh, but it rapidly expanded to other families. Uh, we, we found the reason for the immunodeficiency was very low serum immunoglobulins. But actually, that was really um, almost uh, 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 just a red flag of a variety of different problems. First of all, that there was very low protein overall. So if you look at albumin, which is shown in the black curve, uh, that was very low below normal, which is the dotted line. And uh, the children had chronic uh, diarrhea and had a condition called protein losing enteropathy. So the reason these serum proteins were low is that they were being wasted out of the gut. And, and when you looked at a gut biopsy from these children, you found a condition, uh, I think originally named it NIH, and I'll come back to that in just a few slides, uh, called lymphangiectasia, where there's distortion and damage to the intestinal lymphatics, so they don't return fluid from the gut back into the venous circulation, and it gets wasted in, in the stool. And the consequence of this is that actually these children are starving to death, even though uh, they should be catabolically normal. Uh, and and uh, as a consequence, you can see in these uh, height and weight charts that would be what you'd see in a pediat pediatrician's office, very, very low uh, levels for these children, and that's characteristic. And um, so, so these children are very, very ill, basically from, from birth and are constantly having diarrhea. They also have very severe abdominal pain. Uh, they, they don't like to eat, uh, despite the fact that they're losing protein because of the abdominal pain and they get nauseated and um, just are in constant GI distress that is episodic, but more often on than, than off. And, and to, 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 to even make matters worse, they also are probably losing uh, various clotting inhibitors in the serum and have a diaphysis for very severe blood clots. So including as shown here in the, this middle uh, echocardiogram here, this big round ball here is a, a thrombus in the right atrium, kind of what you'd see in a very elderly person for atrial uh, thrombosis that would accompany atrial fibrillation, which they don't have atrial fibrillation, but they have thrombi there. And then this is a very huge thrombus in the inferior vena cava that essentially clots off their leg if you don't surgically remove this. These are so big that you can't uh, uh, dissolve them with typical anticoagulants. So this is a horrible disease. Uh, it uh, is usually fatal uh, in the second decade of life. And so it's a very serious problem that we wanted to see what we could do to try to solve this. So when we studied uh, originally the, the, the first family and then a number of other families that came to our attention, mainly by collaborators in the country of Turkey, which uh, as part of the clinical genomics program, we set up four centers there to study inherited uh, diseases. And this is uh, uh, mainly uh, coming from Istanbul. And uh, as I'll show you at the end, a lot of the work was done by Ahmet Ozan, that, who came from Marmara University, Ishil Barlin's uh, group, and actually spent a year and a half uh, in, in, in our lab working on this at the bench and has now gone on to uh, lead a large clinical program on this disease and other diseases. And, and what he found by looking at these families were uh, homozygous loss of functions or compound heterozygous loss of function mutations in a gene called CD55, or in the old days, it would be called DK accelerating factor. And this is a cell surface inhibitor of the complement system, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail in a second, uh, which is part of innate immunity uh, that um, uh, is a very potent system to essentially lyse cells. Uh, 
And you can see because it's a surface protein, you can actually see the de de deficiency very visually if you do flow cytometry with an anti-CD55 antibody. You can see in the control cells are very, very positive blood cells, and you can see the patients essentially are either devoid or very, very low for this protein. And you can, uh, uh, as shown on the lower right here, you can uh, also uh, show that uh, by Western blotting. So this is um, a, uh, a, a very clear molecular defect that was common to all of the children that we saw with this uh, very easy to define clinical syndrome. And, and most of those mutations were actually stop stop gain mutations that uh, caused loss, complete loss of the protein, and in many instances, loss of the messenger RNA. So complement is one of those um, uh, uh, systems that unfortunately I have to confess was one of the ones that, you, you, that I would memorize in medical school and then promptly forget. But now having identified these patients, I had to go back and, and, and really learn it. And it was pretty fascinating to see how much had changed in that time period. So initially the conception of the complement was as a complement to antibody mediated killing of uh, invading microorganisms so that the antibodies would bind to the organism uh, as shown here, this immune complex system. And then the C1Q factor uh, here would bind to that antibody and then target this uh, antigen antibody complex into the, the complement system. And the complement system is a series of proteases that eventually lead, as you can see down here, to a complex that can actually bind to the surface of the target and, and lyse, uh, create a pore in the membrane or lyse the, lyse the cell. And, and that complex is very um, uh, 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 excitingly named the membrane attack complex because of that property. And so this is a complex made by these series of uh, proteolytic reactions. And CD55, uh, the cell surface inhibitor, kind of keeps this in check uh, under normal circumstances because it can actually bind to the C3 convertase and inactivate it as shown here on the right. So what that does is it, it shuts down to some level the, um, the um, whole pathway because it, 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 it keeps it in check. But I wanna point out that just in addition to these immune complexes and sort of the standard classical pathway, there are a number of other things that we have heard a lot about in the last 10 to 20 years damage associated molecular patterns, apoptotic cell associated molecular patterns, uh, uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns, all of which can be recognized by specific receptors that sort of look like C1Q. These would be mannose binding lectin or phycolin that can also drive these through uh, uh, as, as uh, lectins uh, to the same pathway. So you can see this can be triggered by a lot of different things and almost certainly is triggered by these different things to have this effect. In addition, you can see that the split products of these convertases turn out also have to have very potent biological activities. These things are called um, uh, uh, anaphylotoxins and they can bind to specific receptors. Uh, many, many, of the, many of the immune system ha cells have these receptors and drive various things like changes in cytokine pathways and all sorts of innate immune types of reactions uh, that can really modulate how the immune system behaves. And, and even uh, what was even more surprising is that these complement factors can be made by cells of the immune system and secreted in local circuits. So it's much more complicated system uh, uh, that has a variety of different roles uh, uh, in the immune, um, uh, in, in immune protective functions, but also has to be carefully modulated because it's a very potent system that can have these effects if it gets out of control on cells of our, our, our own body. So, so what does this have to do with protein losing enteropathy or the kind of gut problems that I described to you? Well, it turns out when you look at the gut biopsies from these children and stain for complement deposition, you can actually see the deposition of complement factors on the cells. And you can even stain and see the membrane C5 to 9 membrane attack complex. So these you will not see in normal gut uh, uh, sections. And that seems to be because, uh, oops, back here, seems to be because these factors get activated in a way that they oughtn't be activated. And the consequences of that are shown here on the right. You get massive inflammation in certain areas, uh, actually a, a situation that looks a lot like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, 
which uh, is um, is uh, something that um, uh, 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 is really not the pathogenesis of uh, the um, uh, a disease, but but it sort of looks pathologically like that. Uh, but but also you get these very huge descended lymphatics, which if you look very carefully at this protomicrograph uh, at a higher power, you can see the, the epithelial breaking down uh, where it's been damaged. And that's why this very protein rich lymph is spilled into the gut and then causing the problems that I described. Now, what was very interesting is one day the postdoc who was working on this with Ahmed, Drew Comrie, came to me and said, Mike, you know, did you know that the old name for this disease in the literature uh, was called Waldman's disease? And I said, really, what Waldman? There's more than one Waldman that I know of in immunology. And so he went back and dug out the paper. In fact, this paper is so old, it is actually not online. You have to go to the National Library of Medicine and get a Xerox copy of the paper copy. And you can see in September, 1961, a, a young clinical associate named Thomas A. Waldman in the NIH Clinical Center actually described a cause of hypoproteinemia was not that there was failed synthesis of protein, but rather that it was being wasted in the gut and actually, I think, coined the term lymphangiectasia uh, to describe this. And uh, sadly, Tom uh, passed away uh, last year, but, but he was alive when we were doing this work, and we actually had the pleasure of doing a grand rounds together uh, about this disease, which is one cause of what he described. And this just show you a picture of Tom as a young clinical associate. You can tell that this is in building 10 because these aluminum windows that you can uh, see here in the background are the same windows here in my office uh, today, built in 1953 and still in service. I don't know what they're doing to this rat here on the countertop, but I'm sure the Animal Care Committee today would not allow that <laughs> to happen. And then this, of course, is Tom before he passed away. He was still doing clinical research here at NIH in the clinical center. He was a great colleague uh, uh, and, and a wonderful friend. So I wanna honor him with this uh, talk. Now, one of the things that also came out that was quite interesting is that um, initially we thought we had two families uh, from the very far Eastern region to unrelated families. But it struck our attention that the same genetic mutation was in both of them. And when we actually did a careful uh, history and, and talked to the relatives, we found out that these were two uh, families in a much larger family pedigree uh, that was uh, uh, essentially there because of a founder effect. And when we talked to the elders in this, the villages in this very far Eastern part of Turkey, they said, oh yes, we know of this disease. It's been in this region for generations. It has a special word in Kurdish called Turtigan, which means cureless or tragic, depending on how you interpret it into English. And it's in this region of Idir in Eastern Turkey. And that region um, uh, 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 seemed to have a high frequency of this so we actually went out there and I brought over from NIH a very small flow cycle machine that I could fit in my suitcase. It was interesting getting that through uh, uh, the uh, TSA uh, officers at Dulles Airport. Uh, but we actually went out there uh, to investigate what was going on. This shows uh, the villages there in Eastern Turkey. This is our group that came from Istanbul. We set up a laboratory in a small ambulance service building. And we went to schools and when the, par the parents would bring the children in, give informed consent, and we would um, take a blood sample and then analyze. And we found that in fact, due to this founder effect, there was a very high carrier frequency in that area, which accounted for the repeated instances of disease. And, and just meeting these children and, and, and seeing how sick the sick ones were really inspired us to try to do something about this uh, disorder to try and reverse it. Uh, and you can see me, I'm buried back here with the sunglasses in the lower <laughs> picture with all the kids. So what, what we did is began to look for ways that we could inhibit the complement system. Now we weren't sure initially, given the extent of damage, that we could actually reverse uh, the disease in a significant way, but we thought we should try. And at that point, there were a number of soluble inhibitors of complement that you could buy from Sigma, uh, chemical company or, or you could get your hands on, none of which had ever been used in the clinic. And then there was one antibody 
uh, therapeutic that had been marketed for another disease of Confluent called paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria by a company in, um, in, uh, uh, in Connecticut named Alexion. And uh, the drug was extremely expensive, uh, but was available and we could do tests. And so the initial tests that we did uh, here showed that the chemical inhibitors, this one in particular, Compstatin, or uh, Echolizumab, the, the MG, M5G 1.1 antibody, which is sort of the prototype antibody for the clinically released form, uh, were extremely potent. And the thing I want to point out here is that even in normal controls, there is some level of complement that you would pick up doing a blood test, activated complement. You will find split products on your cells, but it seems to be in sort of an idling mode where it's not really that active. And um, and, 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 and but goes higher in these uh, uh, individuals, particularly in the gut. And, and that is just completely flatlined by these very potent complement inhibitors. So that gave us hope that we could at least stop the pathogenic uh, process and see what would happen. So I wanted to show you uh, a, a set of data here, which we've now reproduced in many more patients of a group of patients. And, and the measurements that we can do, it's, it's really uh, very, uh, very good, we can very rigorously measure the effect it has on the protein losing enteropathy because going back to the work of Tom Waldman, we can measure total protein, we can measure albumin, we can measure immunoglobulins. And we can also measure other macronutrients which are, 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 dro are, are fallen in these children because of the lack of, um, of being able to return lymph to their venous system. And you can see for years, the scale here is years prior to the break point in the graph here, which is gonna be when we put them on echolizumab, uh, you can see they're way below normal and they don't get up into the normal range spontaneously. Maybe a cup, one patient in there had a little bit of immunoglobulin at the lower level of normal. But for the most part, this is a persistent feature of disease that does not vary. And, and what you see is when you put them on echolizumab, it's just like a miracle. It, it, it immediately, Within and now the scale is weeks, not years. You can see immediately within a couple of weeks they jump up into the normal range. And so long as you keep them on echolizumab, it stays well within the normal range, and 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 continues to get better. And and we've had a couple of instances when the drug wasn't couldn't be available, and someone would come off of echolizumab, and you see that immediately it goes back down. All these parameters go back down. So they really are having to reach a new steady state of complement uh, uh, activation that is much lower and therefore the gut now begins to retain uh, uh, proteins and the protein levels in the blood go up. And we've studied this now very thoroughly. Uh, this is really interesting. I think just here on the left hand, these are endoscopy pictures where you can actually see the large uh, uh, aggregations of lymph right under the mucosal surface. They're, they're so close to the surface that they're, that they're literally you know, visible through the mucosa, the thin layer of mucosal cells. And those are the ones that are kind of breaking open and releasing those proteins into the, um, into the gut lumen. And now when you treat with echolizumab, uh, this is after several months, you now see the mucosa looks like a normal, healthy, hyperemic uh, uh, gut that you don't see those aggregates of, of limb. And all sorts of these um, different manifestations of disease, abdominal pain, nausea, vo oops, vomiting, which as I mentioned to you is present in the majority of patients over time, even with to the past year before treatment. So again, not waxing and waning, essentially go to zero after post-treatment. The, the, the children just have no pain whatsoever. And we have actually one patient who has been treated uh, with a new drug uh, that I won't get a chance to talk about today, uh, uh, but it's also a monoclonal antibody here at the NIH Clinical Center. And we asked him, what was the best thing about your treatment? And he said, uh, I can eat anything I want. I don't have to worry that something's going to cause me to go into this crisis of pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So it's, it's really pretty, pretty, pretty miraculous. And a number of things reversed. The thrombosis, we're not entirely sure of because that's a sporadic event. Uh, it looks like it might be lower. Some of the uh, hypovitaminoses need more time to correct. But in general, you can see that, that the, the clinical uh, manifestations reverse. And you can imagine children this sick 
essentially doctors throw the whole formulary at them, anything they could think of, enteric feeding, uh, vitamins, minerals, anything they can think of. And of course, they don't, they don't work. But now the children go out of the hospital off all other interventions. They essentially are only on uh, echolizumab. So it's really been a spectacular success. And I want to just point out that Amit has been the, 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 the principal architect of all of this uh, success in his clinic at Marmara Hospital. And, and, and we've looked at a whole variety of things. For example, the gut microbiome changes from a very sick microbiome that has very low diversity, as shown on the left, and the presence of a very dangerous, um, I'm sorry, on the right, and the presence of very dangerous bacteria on the left here, Enterobacteriaceae, it now those things reverse and they develop a healthy microbiome, which in, in, in no doubt contributes to their success. So I just wanna show you one boy uh, with permission from his family, uh, what, what this disease looks like. So this, this poor child uh, was very, very sick. You can see the timestamp. This was one of the early patients. I think this was patient five in 2017. You can see that he has very thin, sparse hair because of the starvation. His skin is terrible. The, the dentition is bad. If I pulled away that blanket, which we, we didn't want to do because it looks really horrifying, he, he would look like uh, someone that would be uh, starving, a starving child in, in anywhere in the world, just completely skin and bones. And um, after uh, a couple of years of that calizumab treatment, this is what he looked like at a, at a clinic visit. And this is what he looks like now. And he started to grow all these patients the growth charts just take off in, in height and weight. He still will probably be small uh, compared to normal kids uh, his age, but uh, has done uh, very, very well and, and as have all the other children uh, like this. Uh, so I wanna stop here and just um, say that we now call this clinical entity CD55 deficiency with hyperactivation of complement, angiopathic thrombosis and protein losing neuropathy or CHAPL disease. And as I pointed out, it's due to loss of function mutations in C55. And what's nice is it's very easy to diagnose, as many of these genetic lesions are, uh, by just staining for CD55. So it's easy to now, in, in places where there's not molecular capability, it's still easy to, to, to diagnose. If there's still a challenge <laughs> because echolizumab is not available in all countries around the world. And so we're trying to bring new um, complement inhibitors on the market. And I just wanna point out, this was a great meeting we had uh, in Istanbul with a number of children from a variety of different diseases that we, uh, largely in collaboration with other groups at NIH, uh, Gobu Uzel, and um, just a number of different groups that have been part of the clinical genomics program, to find a series of diseases uh, that now are easy to diagnose. So I point out the diseases, Chai disease, Latte disease, uh, Chapel disease, X-Men disease, and um, Pasley disease, which we now can you know, easily diagnose because of various kinds of features of the disease. And we have uh, treatment, uh, four or five of which uh, have worked uh, in various kinds of clinical settings and clinical trials. Unfortunately, oral magnesium, which we thought was kind of the coolest uh, therapy when we did a, a larger study, did not really have the kind of impact on disease that we were hoping for. So I would count that as a one that did not work, uh, but the others uh, did. And, and, and so the, uh, the children in this picture have been helped by this research at, at NIH. So I just wanna thank a large number of people that have participated, as you can imagine. It's a, it's, it's a very uh, uh, a group effort, a team effort. Drew Comrie and Amit Ozen were the real stars that, that put together the initial paper on um, um, Chapel disease. Uh, our, I think our second case came from Khan Bostek, a really wonderful collaborator in Austria and his uh, graduate student, Rico Artie. A number of people here were part of that initial um, uh, uh, work. And uh, then the treatment study group, which uh, really has defined the effectiveness of echolizumab, is just a huge group of different people that played a variety of different roles that it would take me another hour <laughs> to, to tell you about. Uh, uh, and I won't because my colleague, uh, Dr. Sue, has to speak. So I want to thank you very much uh, for your attention. And um, I guess at this point, turn it over back to, the, to, to Dr. Kastner, the moderator of the talks. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that wonderful and just incredibly moving uh, presentation. And uh, well, I will turn things over in turn 
uh, to Dr. Sue, uh, who I'm sure will have a, a uh, equally uh, uh, exciting presentation. Great, thank you very much. That is very hard to follow, um, but I hope to also convey the excitement and privilege of working on these diseases and bringing hope to kids because we now know how to better treat them um, based upon our knowledge of, of their underlying defects. So I'm going to uh, uh, continue on Mike's theme. He did a great job explaining how we go about studying these diseases. Um, but what I'd like to do is to show that this is not restricted only to diseases that cause immunodysregulation, but also uh, diseases that result in this infection susceptibility. And um, I don't have any relevant disclosures to report, and I'm not going to discuss unlabeled or unapproved uses of drugs or devices today. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think the objective of this part of the talk is to uh, complement the first talk and show you that in some patients, host defense defects may increase virus susceptibility and that we can think of other ways of treating them rather than just treating the virus itself, which is the traditional way of, of treating infectious diseases. So uh, I'm going to start out by saying many people think that if you get a severe virus infection, it's bad luck. But I would counter that by saying that's probably not always the case. We're becoming um, uh, increasingly aware that um, sometimes some people are just uh, have a reason for their bad luck. And, and they may actually have a genetic mutation or variant that makes them susceptible to viruses. And um, if we know exactly what's wrong, that can help you think about new ways of treatment. And so today I'm going to talk about two examples. Um, one is a, 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 a pretty severe disease that's uh, in line with the Mendelian disorders that Mike talked about. The second example is um, perhaps a little bit less clear. Um, it's what we term a monogenic disorder, which there's a little bit more variability in terms of whether you actually have infection uh, problems if you have that particular genetic variant. Um, and so I think this is going to illustrate um, a lot of, uh, of, of the applicability of the approach to something uh, new. Uh, so the first disease is uh, DOC8 deficiency, which is one of our earlier successes. And uh, this you may have heard about because uh, we have a really um, committed patient group at the NIH. This is a disease that's been studied since the 1980s. Actually, uh, when we were studying this disease, I went back to the original clinical notes and saw notes authored on some of the early patients who had died of this disease by Dr. Gallen and Dr. Holland. And the cohort of patients had actually been um, passed down um, to uh, other uh, physicians, including uh, a close colleague of ours that we um, collaborate with, Dr. Alexandra Freeman. So she and I see these patients at the NIH Clinical Center, and it's pretty devastating. As you can see, uh, one of our patients really said she wanted her body to be donated to science to study the research, uh, to perform research and better understand this disease. So um, what we had done at that time was to apply the new genomic technology. So the um, uh, human Genome Project had been completed. There was a map of the uh, genes and the, the, the bases that made up the genes, um, a reference sequence. Uh, that was applied um, in this technique called array comparative genomic hybridization, which we're looking for big chunks of DNA that are missing by comparing our patients' um, DNA, ability to bind to these uh, oligonucleotides that are unique to the uh, different parts of the genome, and they're comparing that binding to binding from a, a control individual. So you can see by the relative binding whether our patient's uh, DNA is missing hunks that would correspond to certain genes. And we thought this would be a, a, a neat way to, in an, in an unbiased approach, to get at things that might be disrupted, that might be contributing to disease. And we were very successful, and we found um, the, the cause of this disease. So this disease, uh, is caused by uh, biallelic mutations in this gene called DOC8. And uh, previously, the disease had been characterized as a form of hyperimmunoglobulinemia E. So these patients have high levels of IgE, which contribute to allergic disease. And it had been thought that this disease was very similar to another disease that had been studying, Job syndrome, which caused a, a lot of problems with uh, skin infections. But if you look more closely at, at this disease, you can see there were some things that were very distinctive about it. And, and rather, 
this disease reflected some problems with uh, lymphocytes, both T cells and B cells, and caused uh, uh, what was a, a combined immunodeficiency with some unusual features, including um, problems with allergies, but more uh, more interestingly, there was a lot of problems with the skin, much more than we see with some of the other immunodeficiencies. So as you see here, um, we noticed that the patients all had an allergic disease of the skin, atopic dermatitis, uh, but infections were really prominent. They had bacterial infections commonly caused by Staph aureus. They, some of them had some mild uh, candida infections uh, of the mucocutaneous uh, uh, regions of the body, uh, but above all, what struck us was that they these patients tend to have really severe problems with viruses, and these are viruses that are, are often encountered by all of us, but our body has an intact immune system, and so we don't have problems with warts like these patients do, as you see below, or with um, this other virus, uh, uh, molluscum contagiosum or herpes simplex virus. So you can see these viruses uh, are cause these rashes, they're really very extensive, they're non-healing, um, and they can cause a lot of disfigurement and functional impairment. And additionally, some of these viruses, such as uh, viruses that are associated with warts, uh, in other regions, they can be associated uh, with cancers, such as cervical cancer in the skin. Uh, they can be associated with squamous cell car carcinomas. So these patients tend to have really bad uh, cancers if their vi viral infections uh, accumulate with time. And so you can imagine this is not a, a nice disease to have. In fact, um, when we uh, participated in this uh, comparison of uh, hundreds of patients worldwide in this uh, uh, survey, we could see that overall that uh, the patients have high morbidity and mortality. So by the time you hit your 20s, over half of these patients are dead. And the ones that are alive, you can see, are, are, are still pretty sick. And it's mainly the, the disease is caused by those uh, infections and particularly the viral infections, and in some cases, the cancers. So the big question is how to treat these patients. Um, their viral infections are really difficult to treat. There's really nothing that works well with them. And so we need a new way to, to cure them. Um, and, and really, um, uh, understanding how the loss of DOC8 causes this disease makes sense in terms of how you're gonna treat them. So what was known about the time when we made a discovery is pretty little about DOC8. It was, uh, it's called dedicator of cytokinesis 8. It's measure, a member of this family of what's termed atypical guanine nucleotide exchange factors. And so it it's helps um, with the activation of this uh, uh, type of uh, this um, member of the small row GTPases called uh, CDC42. So CDC42, when it's um, activated, it's been known from other work, is important for the rearrangement of cells, their cytoskeleton. And so you can imagine it's important for many processes. Um, and so we, 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 were, we didn't know much more about it, so we were saying, to ourselves, okay, let's focus on the clinical aspects of these patients. Um, we know that um, they have a lot of skin disease. Is it because a problem of DOC8 expression within the skin? And so uh, we first tried to look at the expression of this protein, uh, the normal expression of this protein in different cell types you'd find in the skin. And you can see by this Western blot that it's not contained within keratinocytes, fibroblasts, or endothelial cells, but rather within cells of the immune system, including uh, the T, T cells. And uh, T cells are very interesting to us because um, as you may be well aware of, T cells have an important antiviral function. They also function many other ways, but there's a certain class of T cells, CD8 T cells, which are uh, have this property of being able to kill virus infected cells. And so there's definitely a role for, uh, for T cells in antiviral control. And so we decided to focus on the T cells. And um, since the patients had problems with the skin, we decided to look specifically at the T cells from these patients in the skin. So we could do that directly uh, by using uh, tissue explants and, and putting um, uh, labeled uh, patient cells into um, foreskin biopsies. We could also make a mouse model of this disease. So there's, uh, we generated a, 
knockout mouse that lacked DOC8, and we can infect them and sort of visualize the T cells in the different tissues, including the skin. And more easily, we could model the skin by watching uh, these cells as they move within a skin-like environment. So what you see on the right is what happens when we take T cells from either a controlled person who's healthy or a patient, and we put them in a collagen gel. And this is essentially like jello. Uh, the collagen uh, content in skin is really high. It's higher than any other tissue except for uh, certain vessels, um, blood vessels. And we we that that when the collagen polymerizes in the system, you get a, a very tight meshwork, and you're basically asking uh, the cells, the, these lymphocytes, to move around in that meshwork. So it turns out that T cells are very good at moving around. They do that randomly, and we could um, look under the microscope and see what what our patient's T cells. Uh, uh, how they behave. And um, right off the bat, you could see that these patient T cells are very different and um, they are, uh, they're not, uh, they have a very unusual shape that's very long and elongated. We call them stretched cells and the nucleus is also similarly deformed. If you watch these T cells, they um, move, but they move rather abnormally. They sometimes lose a sense of direction and um, they appear to get stuck. Um, and so when you watch them long enough, um, we were able to see something amazing happen. And, and is, that was that the patient T cells here is an example of some, uh, a T cell that's been um, watched for over 20 hours in the microscope. You can see it has this abnormal shape. And then as it's struggling to move through, it actually rips itself into pieces. So it shatters. So the cell shattering is how we came up with the name cytothripsis. And you can see this cell essentially tore itself into pieces because it was undergoing a lot of stress trying to go through the small spaces of that skin-like environment and it's a dead cell. So I'm not gonna go into the details of all, all of the experiments that were done, but we could relate this to the actual phenotype of the viral skin infections in the patient. And it turns out that um, in the skin, there's a special population of T cells. They're called resident memory uh, CD8 T cells. And unlike other T cells that generally circulate through the body between the tissues and the lymphatics, these TRMs stay within the skin, especially in the epidermis. They have a specialized function, and then that is that they monitor for virus infections. So the, the viruses that these patients are afflicted, they are DNA viruses. Unlike some other viruses, they are never completely eliminated from the body. They actually hide out in certain reservoirs. And, um, an example would be herpes simplex virus. It can go back into the, into the nerves. And if you take mice, for instance, and you infect them, they hide out in the nerves. And then uh, it really requires the function of these resident memory T cells in an intact uh, T cell system to suppress that virus. Uh, because otherwise, if it's not there, the virus can get out of these reservoirs and infect um, other skin cells and cause a lot of uh, uh, problems. So you can imagine this phenotype that we only saw in the patient T cells when they're put in this specific environment, we do not see this abnormal death, abnormal stretching occur in, if the cell is in an unstressed environment like in a tissue uh, culture medium dish or in other tissues. This selective death of these uh, T cells results in the inability to limit viral replication. So this is really illuminating because DOC8 expression uh, its lack of in the, in the immune cells means that if you replace the DOC8 deficient uh, immune system in these patients, you might actually be able to fix this problem. And so you would predict that um, these patients would be amenable to uh, bone marrow transplantation. And so because of the large number of patients that were seen at the NIH, um, we had the group from NCI that was led by uh, Dennis Hickstein and then later Nirali Shaw, they were trying to figure out how best to treat these patients. And you can see that they um, figured out uh, great um, methods for having a successful bone marrow transplant. And it's been like magic. This is what happens in the patients when they get the transplantation. You can see that these chronic bad infections of viruses in their skin goes away. Here's an example of the warts before and after the transplantation on the left. And another patient on the right, this is really bad. Um, you can't uh, persistent herpes simplex virus in the, the skin surfaces within the oral mucosa. It goes away with time. So this is a way to cure the, the viral 
in skin infections directing towards the host and not the actual virus. Now, the side effect of this is that the transplant also uh, happens to cure certain other aspects of disease that are, include the uh, tendency for allergy. So one of the facets of this disease is that they have an allergic inflammation of skin, the atopic dermatitis. And when you transplant them, you can see before and after that goes away. And this is probably because we're getting rid of these pathogenic T cells, which uh, in early work we had shown on the right, um, made a lot of of cytokines that are associated with allergy, uh, IL-4, IL-13 that can act on mast cells, et cetera. Um, so when you do a transplant, you get rid of these pathogenic cells. But if you go back one step further in more recent work that uh, we collaborated with Judith Mandel at McGill, she sort of tied in this uh, allergic profile with our original observations of the cell shattering. So it turns out that cytothripsis doesn't only happen in lymphocytes, it happens in mononuclear cells. And if you look at dendritic cells, they undergo this cell shattering and some very beautiful work that she did using conditional not mouse knockouts and adopted transfers, she could delineate this pathway where those dead, uh, those dying fragmented cells make uh, products like IL-1 that feed onto T cells and cause the production of GMCSF and a feedback mechanism that is important for the generation of, the, of these allergic mediators. So, um, so overall, I think um, this illustrates nicely a, a condition where we're directing our therapy towards the host, not the virus, and, um, and, it's, and it makes sense and uh, it's probably the best way to, to uh, treat these patients. Um, so this is a, a disease that is uh, pretty devastating. It has a very high disease penetrance. Actually, it's, you can contrast it to other immunodeficiencies in that these viruses are common viruses. It's not what you usually think of severe immunodeficiencies in which the pathogens are very unusual. These are all common viruses. So in some cases, it's been hard to recognize these patients until their adulthood because um, people just assume, oh, you know, these are things that everyone gets and they don't really recognize this is a very severe presentation of that. Okay, so I'd like to contrast this to a different situation that we've gotten more interested in. And that is uh, in some patients, their problems with viruses are much more selective. They don't have problems with this broad uh, array of viruses, but with a particular virus. So an example would be a patient who's completely healthy and then gets life-threatening infection with influenza, but it only has that once and doesn't seem to occur. Now, you normally think that this is bad luck, right? Uh, but uh, at least in a few individuals in the past couple of years, both we and also the Casanova group in um, at Rockefeller Uni at your University have identified that patients can have genetic mutations that can predispose them to these, out these poor outcomes. And the genetic defects are much narrower. They seem to affect this part of the immune system called the innate immune system. And so there are other parts like the T cells and B cells all work well. And so they usually don't have any other associated problems that you would typically uh, see with when there's a broad defect in adaptive immunity. So we've been interested in, um, in understanding this, my lab in particular with respiratory virus infections and been studying rhinovirus as well as influenza virus. But um, around a couple of years ago when the pandemic struck, we were pretty much poised to sort of pivot to SARS-CoV-2 research. And so we teamed up with Jean Laurent's group in this uh, collaboration that uh, we both direct a, a consortium that is dressed, uh, that is aimed to address why is it that not everyone who gets infected with this virus gets sick? Um, and so it turns out, as you are all pretty well aware of, it's only a minority of people who, who develop life-threatening uh, COVID-19 disease. And uh, our hypothesis was that these individuals had certain genetic variants that could predispose them to infection. And I say at this point, predisposition, because the whole this type of disease had been identified in other virus con susceptibility conditions, like I mentioned influenza, also herpes simplex encephalitis, but the, the disease penetrance is not as high as what we see with the Mendelian disorders, the disorders that Mike mentioned or that the DOC8 deficiency that I talked to you about. So there's a lot that we still don't know uh, about this type of, of disease, but certainly it seems to be contributing. And so uh, to 
to address this question or this hypothesis, um, we focused mainly on the role of type one interferons. And, and this is because there was a lot of work done in um, over decades in experimental infections, uh, viral infections of mice, as well as in tissue culture, showing that this pathway is critical for antiviral control. So just to review for you, at, at the onset of infection, for instance, during a respiratory tract virus infection, those initially infected cells, including respiratory epithelial cells and the specialized uh, white blood cell, plasmacytoid dendritic cells that take up the virus, their first response is to make these type one interferons. These type one interferons can act on the same infected cells or they can be secreted and act on neighboring uninfected cells. And uh, the cells respond to these type one interferons by undergoing a bunch of changes intracellularly that affect processes such as transcription and translation. And by doing that, they can suppress viral replication. So this is really important because it's the first body's first response and it needs to be um, activated while you're waiting for the rest of the immune system to kick in. It really takes time for those T cells and NK cells and B cells to be activated and, and to kill off virus infected cells, et cetera. So uh, what we did as part of this large international consortium that we uh, co-direct the COVID human genetic effort, uh, this is, uh, is to look at genes involved in type one interferon. So in this consortium, there are hundreds of sequencing hubs that perform whole exome and whole genome sequencing on patients that are recruited at uh, lots of medical centers worldwide. And those data are shared. And we look specifically at at genes involved in the type one interferon pathway that had already been shown when mutated to be associated and contribute to susceptibility to certain other viruses. And so you can see the results that were summarized uh, here in this uh, cartoon. Basically, uh, we could find a proportion of patients, it's relatively small around uh, two to 3% of people uh, who were critically ill with uh, uh, SARS-CoV, uh, two, who had mutations that either resulted in the loss of expression or the loss of function of these genes that were important for either sensing initial viruses for production or amplification of the type 1 interferons or for response to the type 1 interferons. So uh, you can go look at the original papers. I've referenced all of them in, in the um, presentation, but essentially I'm going to skip over all the extensive work that was done in vitro. We had highlighted a few patients uh, with deficiency in certain genes like uh, IRF7, it, the interferon type one receptors or TR3, but basically those defects impaired the production of type one interferons and in, in its in infections in vitro with SARS-CoV-2, they also uh, were uh, caused the inability to, to limit virus replication. So it really explains why these people uh, tend to do poorly when they get infected. What was interesting to us is that it brought up this other idea. So it had been known in the literature that you can have mutations in cytokines or certain cytokine receptors and they can give rise to an infection phenotype. An example would be mutations in a different type of interferon, type two interferon or interferon gamma, which has slightly different properties from the type one interferons. Mutations in that can result in uh, problems with handling infections with mycobacteria. Um, but there are other group of patients who don't have those mutations and yet have uh, autoantibodies against interferon gamma. So they make antibodies that can bind and neutralize interferon gamma and sort of recapitulate the same pathway. And they get the same susceptibility to uh, the same type of microbes. And this is a theme that occurs not only with interferon gamma, but also with other cytokines like IL-17 uh, for mucocutaneous candidiasis, IL-6 for staph infections, and GMCSF for nocardia. So the whole idea is that, okay, how about some of our critically ill COVID patients? They may not have mutations in this pathway, but do they have autoantibodies that can mimic this pathway? And so, um, so at that point, um, uh, Paul uh, Bastard in the Casanova group and Lindsay Rosen in uh, Steve Holland's group. Um, Steve has also spent a large number, a uh, large part of his career looking at uh, autoantibodies to cytokines. They teamed up to sort of test the hypothesis to see whether these autoantibodies against type 1 interferons could be seen 
in the COVID patients. And it turned out that that was indeed the case. So you can see that critically ill patients, um, this is nearly a thousand patients, they had autoantibodies that bound to certain type one interferons very well, but not to other cytokines. Additionally, you can compare that to uh, several, like 600 to 700 patients who had very symptomatic or mild uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, presentations who did not have these autoantibodies, and also very low levels of people with autoantibodies taken from healthy controls pre-pandemic. And not only did these autoantibodies bind to type 1 interferons, but they actually neutralize the function of those type 1 interferons. So in just a selected example, uh, we could uh, look for that by looking at uh, a, a specific readout, normal uh, peripheral body not mononuclear cells, if you stimulate them with type 1 interferon, you get this response within minutes, this phosphorylation of STAT1 occurring within the cell. And you can measure that by flow cytom cytometry. So that, it, that occurs even if you take plasma from a healthy um, controlled donor and you throw it on to those uh, responding cells. But in the case of some of these critically ill COVID-19 patients who had autoantibodies against type 1 uh, interferon, those autoantibodies were actually neutralizing. So here you see an example of plasma from one patient who has neutralizing autoantibodies against uh, type interferon alpha. And so when you stimulate those normal donor uh, cells with uh, interferon alpha, there's no response. On the other hand, this particular patient doesn't have neutralizing autoantibodies against interferon omega. And so uh, the, the, the bottom line is these patients have neutralizing autoantibodies. We can actually see that it's having an effect in them because if you look at interferon in their plasma early during infection, you can see it's much decreased because that binding results in the clearance of the cytokines and it also prevents that feed forward loop that amplifies the interferon response. And more importantly, in the experiments that Charlie Rice's group also performed to help um, solidify the case, you could see that those those plasma samples from patients with these neutralizing autoantibodies actually did interfere with the ability of exogenously added interferon to suppress viral replication. And so that's shown here. So we're using an indicator cell line, which is infected with SARS-CoV-2. And you can see how much uh, replication is going on in those cells. When you add uh, type 1 interferon into those uh, culture dishes, you can see you suppress viral replication that occurs uh, even if you put plasma from a healthy donor, but adding plasma from these critically ill COVID-19 patients who have these neutralizing autoantibodies, that neutralizes the added interferon alpha. And so now you get virus replication. So uh, it, it, it indicates this is quite significant. And it turns out that there's uh, uh, other associated data showing that the presence of these autoantibodies in the patients has an effect. So here you're, you're seeing that if you had autoantibodies to type 1 interferons, you actually um, remain persistently positive for um, SARS-CoV-2 in a PCR test for longer periods of time. It also tends to be associated with uh, increased likelihood that you'll be in the ICU. Uh, curiously, though, it doesn't really affect mortality. Uh, so what this tells us is that the, these autoantibodies really seem to have their major effect early on during infection. And um, if you can be enter early on, you might potentially alter the fate of these patients. So it'll be really important to identify these patients. It turns out that um, uh, depending upon the different centers, you can get anywhere between 10% to 20% of critically ill patients actually have autoantibodies. And so let's see whether we could identify them early and see whether you could do something about it. And so um, I just wanna point out that that might be a little bit complicated because um, we found in some additional longitudinal studies that if you take these people with these autoantibodies and you follow them over time, what happens is that those levels of autoantibodies decrease uh, as, as they recover from uh, the virus. And then um, that's not only in terms of binding, but also in terms of neutralizing activity. And whereas most of them maintain neutralizing activity, there are some which lose that activity. So if this goes back, back down to baseline, you really need a very sensitive way to detect these autoantibodies at a time early before they get infected. Uh, so that's a big question, but um, if you could identify them, you could presumably um, intervene with them.
so, um, so because of the importance of this, I think um, Paul Bestard and the Casanova Group, uh, we, we went back to address whether you could get a more accurate uh, measure of people with these autoantibodies against type 1 interferon. And since the earlier studies were looking at very uh, the ability of the plasma to neutralize um, levels of type 1 interferon that are super physiologic, he decided to go back into all those samples and see whether we can detect more people who have these autoantibodies that would be able to neutralize the levels that you would typically see in the viral infection. So this is um, at least 100 fold lower than our initial studies. And when you do that, you can pick up more patients, not only at, um, in the controls, but, but much more patients in the critically or severely in infected patients. And that's where you're getting about 20% rather than initial studies of 10% of the patients who would have those autoantibodies. So this is why it's so important because you can see that this is a major uh, risk factor for outcome. Um, we're looking here at the infection fatality rate uh, after infection with SARS-CoV-2. Here's what you see in the general population. As we all know, as you get older, you have increased mortality from the virus. If you're male, that's another well-known factor that makes you worse off. But if you have these autoantibodies, you have higher risk of actually um, getting um, critically ill and even dying from the virus. So, um, so knowing this, brings up a whole bunch of questions. Um, can, is there ways that you can bypass the defect? Clearly in those subset of patients who have the genetic defects, as long as you don't have a mutation that actually impairs the receptor, you can bypass the genetic defects by directly giving interferon, type one interferons. And we know that interferon, um, for instance, is FDA approved for use in other therapies. And uh, um, you know, actually in our DOC8 patients, they had been treated uh, with uh, unsuccessfully with interferon to try to suppress their uh, viral replication. But this might be a different setting, which it might be useful. Another idea is that if patients who have autoantibodies, maybe you could get rid of those autoantibodies if you do it early enough. You can remove the autoantibodies by plasmapheresis, or you could potentially also give them um, type 1 interferons that are, are not specifically neutralized by uh, these autoantibodies. So uh, there's a lot of studies, I think a lot of interest in trying to follow up on those. And uh, clearly clinical trials are needed to determine whether knowing that target and intervening will make a difference. But at least it sets us on a pathway to think of how to be uh, smart about treatment. So I hope um, by these examples, I've shown you that we can not only think about antivirals to treat viruses, but manipulating the immune system. And this is part of the rationale for vaccines and such. But you could also think of genetic defects that alter the function in specific hosts and, and develop ways in which you can uh, therapeutically target these defects to uh, you know, result in a personalized way of treating uh, these patients' viral infections. Okay, so uh, as you can imagine, this is a lot of uh, work done over the years from many, many groups. And uh, there's literally thousands of people in these involved in these studies, so there's no way I could include everyone, but I just wanted to highlight some of our key collaborating groups, both at the NIH and elsewhere. So for DOC8 deficiency, um, longstanding uh, close collaborator of ours is Dr. Alexandra Freeman. Uh, and we've also worked with the NCI group for the transplantation, uh, Heidi Kong uh, for some of the virome studies I didn't talk to you about, multiple other centers uh, to address other aspects of, of physiology, pathophysiology in the disease. Uh, for COVID-19, as I mentioned, um, uh, we've been involved with these studies uh, through the COVID human genetic effort and the Casanova group. Um, at the NIH, we have uh, another consortium that we um, have uh, set up, the NIAID COVID consortium that includes Gigi Notarangelo, uh, Steve Holland's lab and Mihalis Leonakis. Uh, our genetic studies and where we're doing the sequencing of uh, whole genome sequencing with COVID is not possible without uh, a collaboration with Clifton Dalgard at the American uh, Genome Center at USIS. And of course, um, a longstanding and close collaborator of Mike Leonardo, uh, who also co-runs the NIAID clinical genomics program. It's been great um, uh, because Mike has this really strong, very uh, 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 strong basis in in um, fundamental basic science and, and bring it together with the clinical 
uh, observations we make has been very productive and a lot of fun. So um, I think I've ended there. I may have raced through things, but it's always good to have more time on the other end. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Helen and Mike, for that fantastic uh, uh, series of presentations. And I must say that it was even better than I had uh, imagined that it could be. So uh, there are lots of questions uh, for the two of you uh, with regard to uh, some of the, the details. It certainly is very thought provoking. And I guess that I'll uh, turn the first question to Helen. And, and, you know, this may be one of these questions that, you know, there's, there is no answer to, but, but it's always good to, to think about these kinds of things. So why would it that someone would make antibodies against um, interferon? I mean, why would you do such a thing uh, to yourself? Um, and are there risk factors for it? Or is it genetic? Or, um, you know, is there some sort of environmental thing that causes you to do it? Or, you know, it looks like from what you showed that it, they go up and down. Is it some sort of an immune response to the to the, the body's evolving immune response itself? What's, what's going on there? Well, I think those are really good questions that we can't answer. I mean- uh, yeah, Well, that's what I said. <laughs> that's the bottom speculate. line, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, you know, we tend to make antibodies to things that we're not tolerized against. And I don't know, you would kind of think it normally when you are young, or at least in utero, you're not exposed to a lot of interferons unless your mother is infected, um, you know, those torch infections, et cetera. But when you're born, you should be exposed to, to interferons, right? And so um, uh, there should be some measure of tolerization of T cells and the T cell dependent B cell responses. So maybe if you get, in, this is really speculative, maybe the natural course of infections when you're young is actually a good thing because otherwise you would, you would encounter those infections and encounter infection induce interferons and make an antibodies. I don't know. And they might be um, bad in that case. Um, I, there's another um, factor that I didn't mention is that interferons are double-edged sword. They're not always all good. I mean, they're good for viruses, but there are a class of diseases called interferonopathies. And these people are born with mutations then which they make lots of interferons. And that is not a good thing. It can be associated with uh, with um, certain diseases, um, and they can be associated also with uh, autoimmunity. Lupus, for instance, has been associated with that. So, um, so there might be some situations where having these autoantibodies might be not so good for virus infections, but they may actually be protective in other cases where you don't want so much of an immune response. But mm -hmm. all this begs the questions of why these in particular. It's a great, great question, and I, I know people are trying to address those issues. Yeah, well, thank you for that very thoughtful uh, answer. Uh, just to follow up a, a little bit, are there other cytokines where people make autoantibodies against them? And, and if so, how does that work? Yeah, I think I went through this really quickly, but I tried to say the whole idea that we we're looking at autoantibodies to type 1 interference was driven by the fact that there are other diseases with autoantibodies against other cytokines. So there are examples of autoantibodies to interferon gamma that can result in mycobacterial susceptibility, autoantibodies to IL-17 associated with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, autoantibodies to uh, IL-6 and, and, and invasive and skin staph infections uh, that very much look like what you get when you have genetic defects in the same pathways. Why do you get those autoantibodies? Um, you know, in some cases it may be related. We, we know at least in the case of interferon gamma autoantibodies that it can be related to your HLA types and, um, and probably exposure because people who develop that tend to be in Southeast Asia. Uh, but a lot of the same questions, of what is it that triggered the production in the first place? Uh, you know, exposures, other genetic factors or others, we, we don't know in uh, detail. So it, at this point, I'm sorry to keep picking on you, but uh, at this point, uh, when someone goes into the ICU um, or, or even is admitted uh, to the hospital with severe uh, COVID-19, is it routine practice now to check for autoantibodies against interferon? Yeah, 
no, it is not routine. Um, you know, I think there's there's clearly uh, an association that if you have them, you're at higher risk. And it would be nice to know if you can detect them, whether you can change the, the outcome. But this is not something that is routinely used um, and tested. And part of it is, is that um, you, know, you have to be able to interpret certain levels as, as being associated with the clinical outcome to do anything. And I don't think that data is quite solid yet at this point. Um, but there's a lot of interest to, to try to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you flip things around a little bit um, uh, and you say, okay, well, you know, antibodies against uh, interferons are not good if you have COVID-19 or, or, you know, if you have certain genotypes where you don't make enough interferon, that's, that's also not good. Um, so uh, but I would like to interrupt that. Yeah, so <laughs> it may be not good for getting sick and going to the ICU, but it may actually be protective later on because you'll notice from the mortality curves that it didn't make it mm -hmm. more likely to die. It just made you more likely to land in the ICU. So as I said earlier, interferons are a double-edged sword. Too much interferon or not enough interferon, they can have different effects. So it may be protective if you're really sick. You don't get more likelihood of dying. And that's kind of in line, I think, with some data using JAK inhibitors that have been tested clinically, um, that they may actually modulate really pro-inflammatory responses during COVID infection that might actually be de deleterious clinically in certain contexts. So. Uh -huh. And so this, this next question sort of goes along with what you were just saying, and, and that is the question of uh, how effective are interferons in the treatment of um, uh, COVID-19? Have there been any trials? And, and if so, have they, how, how have they done? The late trials haven't been effective, but I would argue that everything we know about how interferons work, you would want to give them early. And I know there are some trials, there's an inhaled form of interferon beta. I think that's being tested. Um, I don't know what those results are, but um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm sure people are looking at early because that's when you would expect this antiviral effect to have most um, relevance physiologically. Oh. I suppose there could even be inducers of interferon. You know, there are certain uh, compounds that induce uh, interferon that you could give. Maybe it would be easier or cheaper or something like that uh, to to administer them rather than the interferons themselves. Yeah, that's a possibility. But the interferons themselves are already approved, so um, they are used in other contexts, like certain cancers and things like that, for their non-virus related effects. So you kind of avoid some of there's some experience using those, maybe yeah. not so much with the inducers. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for those uh, answers. And uh, the next set of questions uh, is directed at Mike. Um, so uh, in any case, uh, the question for him, again, you know, this is one of these, you know, why is there air kinds of questions, you know? So, uh, so uh, in any question, case, uh, the question for uh, Dr. Leonardo is, uh, he mentioned that there's a very high uh, carrier frequency of the uh, mutations or the mutation, I guess, in um, uh, CD55 in this uh, particular area in uh, Eastern Turkey. And so, you know, at least sometimes for, uh, recessive uh, diseases when you have a high carrier frequency. Sometimes it's just a founder effect, as, as you uh, rightly said. Uh, but sometimes there could even be a selective advantage uh, to being a carrier uh, for these mutations. And so uh, the question would be, is there a phenotype, uh, maybe just an immunologic or biochemical phenotype that's associated with being a carrier for such a mutation? Um, and, um, you know, would there be any evidence or has it been looked at, you know, with regard to, you know, could there be uh, a reason and uh, a uh, an advantage for those individuals who who carry the mutation. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, right now it looks like the HETs have no deleterious phenotype. So uh, you know, people in the family that are heterozygous for the mutation are going to be fine, so they can pass it on. And of course, in Turkey, we know that there's a lot of um, uh, intermarriage consanguinity, particularly in these very rural areas, 
uh, where there is, um, they're in small villages and the only available spouse may be in your village. So that tends to, to, to create the founder effect um, penetrance. Uh, whether or not the heterozygotes have some sort of advantage against infectious diseases in that particular area of Turkey is a fascinating idea, Dan. I hadn't actually thought about that, but I think um, that uh, could be something that should be considered. I don't know how we would address that experimentally, except you know, working with those families over many years, we might begin to see something that would crop up in people that don't have the mutation that 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 is uh, suppressed in the heterozygotes. Um, but um, uh, but I think right now the, the groups in that region, the the people have very large families, and uh, actually many kids die of this, and they just keep having more kids. And um, there are some on the on the edge of the spectrum that can actually be homozygous and live to reproduce, but mm -hmm. uh, generally they're pretty sick, uh, and, and that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's really uh, interesting. Um, you know, you would just think that because the the patients themselves with two hits uh, do have this hyperinflammatory uh, phenotype, and so it could be that one hit would would in some way uh, be protective. You know, against something uh, that would be uh, seen in that part it of be. it. Could be, and, and I think the thing that. Um, that goes along with that is that we, you do have that idling. So I think if we were to carefully study all the HETs, the question would be, would you actually see more robust complement responses, you know, maybe just, you know, to, to normal uh, commensals or to, to, you know, pathogenic bacteria or other microorganisms. It's a really, really interesting Thing to think and about. is it all the same yeah. mutation in in that part of Turkey? Uh, you said it's a founder effect, so I just guess it must be just all the yeah. same mutation. Uh -huh. Just in that region, yeah. But but and that's what kind of keyed us into that region because there were two things we thought were independent that come to Istanbul for medical care, and we had no idea they were related. But then eventually, when you get that gigantic pedigree, you realize they're different branches of actually the same family. And um, but all throughout Turkey and in fact throughout the world, there are cases in many other countries, uh, Pakistan, um, uh, Thailand. Uh, they're, they're different mutations. There's no hot spots in this particular gene, and they're usually lost to function. I see. So there are uh, other known mutations in this gene that yeah, that are yeah. a similar phenotype. Yeah, very similar. But it is really uh, uh, something when you see what you think are two separate families that, that have uh, the same mutation in, in the same gene with a similar phenotype, and then it turns out that they are distantly related uh, to one another. Yeah. Uh, Hirsch Kamaro, uh, who uh, is in NIAID, was doing a collaborative study with our group uh, a while back, uh, looking at individuals who break out in hives uh, when subjected to a vibratory uh, stimulation. Like if you oh, yeah, heard about this the person one. into coming into mm -hmm. your lab and put their arm on a vortex machine, uh, then they will break out in hives, uh, vibratory urticaria. Um, and, and so he had this very family uh, that he was seeing at the NIH who had that, who had a particular uh, mutation uh, in a gene called ADG, ADGRE2. And, and there's someone named Ken Kidd, uh, who's a geneticist at Yale, who had described a similar phenotype back in the 1980s. And so we tracked down that family. They had the same mutation. And it turns out that they both come from the same village in Lebanon, you know, and, and in fact, it, it probably is, you know, one big extended family. So, you know, it's, it's a small world, I guess, is uh, about all that you can say. Um, so, so in any case, one of our other uh, attendees uh, is commenting uh, to Mike, but I think that either Mike or Helen could answer this question or at least take a whack at it. Uh, I am wondering, how do you go about identifying Mendelian causes of disease when family members are missing? Well, that can be a big problem uh, because 
you know, I, I think it, it that problem illustrates a broader issue that uh, sometimes I think paper reviewers, study sections <laughs> uh, don't 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 understand, and that is doing human research has a whole sociology to it, which is the sociology of humanity. And you don't have that when you have a knockout mouse or, you know, a model system or you're just doing biochemistry. And so it is, uh, it is a problem. Uh, of course, as you know, since you're, you're one of the, 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 the real uh, uh, great adherents of this type of research and most successful, that you work with the local doctors and they have to establish their close relationships with the families and try to get the trust and the excitement about participating while still adhering to the tenet of basic of, of medical research, which is we can't promise you that you will get better. We are doing this for the, the benefit of humanity. It's not the practice of medicine, it's the practice of research. But to get that balance right and to establish trust and to get the family's participation uh, is something you have to work hard at and, and, and cooperate with the groups that know the patients. Many, in many instances, it's the nursing staff that really know the patients or sometimes the social workers. So you have to establish trust and try to get those family members to look at it. But it, in, 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 in some cases, it does fail. Or, you know, Aunt Rita or Aunt uh, Mabel don't want to, you know, do medical research. They don't want to be stuck with a needle. You know, there's all sorts of reasons. So in that case, you know, it depends on the gene. So you try to use everything at, in, in, at your disposal scientifically to get the answer. Uh, Pasley disease was very interesting because there, they were mutations that activated an enzyme. And as you can imagine, from the structure of a protein, things that will activate the active site of the enzyme have to be in very specific places. They can't be stop codons. They can't be things all over the place. And so in that instance, we were very fortunate. In fact, the group in, in England that also discovered this disease at the same time picked it up, the bioinformatician picked it up because he had the identical amino acid changed two different molecular ways, but the same amino acid in the same gene in two completely unrelated families. In that case, I guess he had a strong argument why they were completely unrelated. So that was a huge clue and you didn't need family members for that clue. It was just in the patients. Because uh, it was it's a heterozygous dominant activating mutation, so it really depends on the gene, and it really depends on what you can learn about what the gene mutations do to the gene. And so, uh, but but it does. I think everyone who does this kind of research has a group of families where they've got very variants. They have hits in different genes, and you just it's very tough to figure it out whether there's one of those are the culprit or you've got something in an oncoding region that you haven't even considered. Uh, so it, it's tricky when um, you don't have everyone in the family. Sometimes it's tricky even if you have everyone in the family. So <laughs> you just have to, you know, you just have to use all the tools that you can. And luckily, uh, both in terms of contemporary technologies and in terms of being at the National Institutes of Health, you have many, many tools that you're, your disposal to, to try to solve these. So it's been, it's been very rewarding. Yes, yes, yes. It is, it is a wonderful adventure. There's no question about that. So then maybe uh, going on this riff a little bit uh, with regard to non-familial uh, kinds of things, uh, what about um, somatic mutation? Uh, and its role in, in these kinds of uh, diseases. Um, somatic mutation, of course, is something that is common. Uh, you know, we see it all the time in, in cancers. Um, do you see that ever in, in um, you know, immunologic disease? Yes. So um, one of the really most exciting studies I think I've ever read uh, was uh, a study by a guy named Fred Rulacat, who worked very closely with Alain Fischer in Paris. And, um, you know, we were, we were stumped by a number of different patients with a disease that I worked on with Steve Strauss and his colleagues, uh, Tom Fleischer uh, and Elaine Jaffe, called ALPS, Autoimmune Lymphoproliferative Syndrome. And we had kids that met all the criteria that you could establish clinically. And um, 
And yet uh, they didn't have mutations in FAS or CAS bases or things that we had identified. And what uh, is characteristic of the disease is a particular cell type that are called double negative T cells. These are alpha beta rearranged uh, uh, T lymphocytes that look in that respect like normal lymphocytes, but they lack both the CD4 and CD8 co-receptors. And these can build up to extraordinary, extraordinary levels in these patients. And in, in your eye, they're gonna be less than 1% in a normal person. Some kids with, with this disease had 30% of circulating T cells or T cells in the secondary lymphoid organs that would have this phenotype. And uh, there were many reasons to believe that these were disease causing. But the study that they did was they said, okay, let's take families that have um, very high levels of these cells and isolate the cells from the other lymphocytes and look and see if those have a mutation because you might miss it if you do the mm. whole mixed pool. You, you could get it, but in those days, it was a little bit tougher you know, to, 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 to identify the mutation. In fact, it may have been the days we we're still doing hand sequencing, if you can believe it. And, uh, and uh, what they showed is that the mutations in it, in this, I, I would say maybe 10 to 20%, uh, I don't know, Kennedy Rao now has identified a number of these, these uh, patients in the NIH cohort, uh, but, but they, they have it just in the double negative T cells. So it is a somatic mutation in a subset, and these were fast mutations, uh, and, and, and they cause a subset of the cells to adopt the disease phenotype. And the disease is indistinguishable, as far as I, I, I know, from ALPS that is germline. So that's a perfect example of what you're talking about, causing a phenocopy of disease just by a somatic mutation in the lineage that drives the disease. Now, there, there must be some other differences, you know, that we just haven't found because FAST can be expressed in other tissues, for example, the liver. But they don't have mutations in the liver. They're just in the double negative T cells. It's a beautiful, beautiful study and uh, really opened my eyes to how important the consideration of somatic mutations uh, is, yeah, and, I, and there are other examples of that now. I'm sure in in in, in your area of the immune system, auto inflammation, but but in other areas too. Yeah, it it certainly is. It's a fascinating uh, thing, and and it, you can imagine just from the examples like what you're talking about, that there probably are a lot of others and it's just that they're kind of hard to find sometimes these yeah. somatic mutations, yeah. you know, as you said, you know, especially when you're having to, to look at it at a uh, uh, single cell or populations of cells, uh, you know, to see the mutations just in those cells and not in, in the rest of the cells. So now we have another question for Helen, actually, uh, that has to do with CDC42. Uh, and so, of course, CDC42, as you correctly said, you know, is, is a molecule that's very important in the organization of the cytoskeleton. And, and you pointed out in the one model you showed in one of your slides, uh, the excessive production of IL-1 beta uh, by uh, mononuclear cells uh, in patients with DOC8 deficiency. Um, certainly, um, the inflammasome, uh, which activates IL-1 beta, is, is uh, intrinsically tied up with the cytoskeleton. Is there any connection there, uh, the CDC42 and, and uh, inflammasome activation? Uh, has not been looked at specifically in DOC8 deficiency, but there are conditions of, I think, CDC42 mutant patients with uh, an activating mutation that I think have some features of inflammation. They can get like a activating, manic activating syndrome or HLH-like phenotype. Uh -huh. um, it's really complex because I think the target, it, it doesn't just activate, you know, all genes, but it can, it can um, have different impacts on different gene targets that, that CDC42 works through. Mm -hmm. But it is a very interesting um, and nuanced question about what uh, these um, genes are doing, even if they're disturbed in different diseases, it's that um, all the genes together that are influencing the outcome. Yeah. 
Yeah. So here's another question here. Um, uh, and, and maybe we've kind of touched on it a little bit with the somatic mutations. Uh, the question is uh, influence of genetic mosaicisms on these conditions. I guess that to some extent we've covered that. Do you guys have anything more to add from uh, what we uh, just talked about with uh, I can add. Uh, yeah. So Doc 8, I didn't get into this story, but rather than somatic mutations, there's a condition where there's somatic reversions. And mm. What happens is that mutation is in an area of the genome that's very prone to recombination. So it's probably resulting in the generation of these large deletions in this gene, but it also uh, with cell division is probably trying to fix the mutations by using the other allele um, that may not be mutated in that same location as the first allele as a template to um, fix the first one. So the body is, at least in some patients, actually um, some of the cells make the protein, DOC8, um, but not, other cells do not. Overall, when we've done look at those patients closely, they seem to be a little better clinically, but it's not enough. And so in this case, the mosaicism is contributing to the um, extent of disease or the, the severity of disease, but because of the nature of the target cell T cells, you don't you not only have to fix the doc eight, you actually have to fix in every T cell that has a unique repertoire. Mm -hmm. Those patients are still sick. So the bottom line is yes, it can, those mosaicisms can influence um, clinical presentation. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. That's that's really fascinating. Uh, this whole idea of, of reversion is is really something, that's for sure. So then we have another question uh, having to do with um, uh, the rare variants that this is sort of going back to Mike Leonardo's uh, early slide with regard to the rare variants and the common variants and so forth. So do you ever have a situation in which some gene that has been uh, identified where the spotlight has been put on this gene uh, by one of your Mendelian studies, uh, do you ever find that there are common variants in that gene that are associated with, you know, uh, more common diseases, you know, with, uh, with uh, common variable immunodeficiency disease or with uh, um, autoimmunity or whatever? Yes. I mean, I mean that, that's, um, not uncommon. <laughs> uh, and and uh, uh, I, the, my favorite example of that is actually the wonderful work by Brown and Goldstein, who actually started their work here in the NIH Clinical Center with a single family that had uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, a very severe form of it, and then ultimately traced that to the LDL receptor and did all the beautiful work on LDL receptor. And I believe that that um, in, in, among uh, individuals in the normal population that have sort of um, uh, a distribution of high cholesterols, not, not an explicit single level, but, but rather a distribution, you do find higher levels of various kinds of, uh, I don't wanna call them um, minor alleles, but, but they're, they're sort of variants that, that, that do affect function, but not as severely as a complete loss. Mm -hmm. So there's a good example of that kind of correlation that it can can target you towards a uh, a particular pathway, and I think there 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 are a large number of examples of that. But that's just happens to be my favorite. It's not immunology, but I think it's a yeah. really good one. It's it's human biology, which is great. Um, yeah. So, so then another questioner here, uh, it, it seems to recall something about an association between immunodeficiency and autoimmunity. Uh, and are, are there examples in the diseases that you guys work on uh, where you get this um, sort of uh, uh, combined uh, sort of phenotype of, of both too little and too much immunity caused by mutations in the same gene? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, a lot of the paradigms we work under were uh, created by thinking logically about human disease in the premolecular era. So there was this sort of idea that you had a teeter-totter and you had autoimmunity was one side went up and immunodeficiency was went down. And I think that 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 you know, those are very useful ways to kind of heuristics to, to think about uh, science, uh, 
But when you get down to the molecular level, molecules control complicated networks and cells. And so a, an example that we just published um, about a year ago was mutations in a protein called HEM1. That's a, a scaffolding protein in a, uh, a complex called WAVE, WAVE regulatory complex, which controls actin in the cell. And it has a number of different effects when you take that protein out of the picture. It's a, it's a lymphoid restricted protein. So it really affects the immune system more prominently than other systems in the body. And when you begin to mess around with the, the actin network, uh, you can get immunodeficiency. And in this instance, uh, Comrie uh, and Sarah Cook did beautiful work showing that the migration, for example, of neutrophils is really weird in, when you take away M M1 from, from cells in the immune system. And you can just imagine they can't get lymphocytes, or, I'm sorry, neutrophils to where they need to go to fight bacteria and those kinds of infections. Um, they had hyperactive uh, a release of granules from, from lymphocytes. Mm -hmm. And that relates to work that was done by Jennifer Lippincott-Schwartz, who used to be at NIH, is now at Virginia Farms, showing that the cortical actin network is sort of a barrier to the release of, 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 of granules. And that if that begins to become thinned or becomes defective in some way, the granules can release more robustly. So, so now you have release of cytokines and all kinds of things that are that is increased by the very same molecular defect that can cause a clear form of immunodeficiency. So I think um, if you, the, the way we thought about it in there is that there are certain global systems in the cell, say the nucleus or actin or things. So when you begin to perturb those, you're going to get complex effects that are not going to fit the traditional mm. heuristic for autoimmunity versus immunodeficiency because you're affecting global things about immune cells and some things might work less well than you think, whereas some things might make work a lot better. Mm -hmm. So at least one simplistic way of thinking about it is if, if a certain molecular change were to have um, one kind of an effect in lymphocytes and another kind of effect in granulocytes, let's say. And so, you know, in the, the lymphocyte effect would create increased immunity and the granulocyte effect would uh, cause immunodeficiency, let's say. Uh, that would be one, one simple way of thinking about it anyway. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let me see. Um, are there any other uh, uh, questions here? Um, oh well, going back just a minute uh, to the uh, to the um, patients with the CD fifty five uh, mutations, um, uh, is there any um, immunodeficiency that's that's caused by uh, treating these patients with ecolizumab? Ah, very good point. So theoretically, of course, yes. Um, one of the things uh, that you see in patients with deficient complement are meningococcal uh, uh, infections. And so uh, everyone that goes on the drug is uh, vaccinated against those to try to minimize the chance they'll have complications. And we don't, um, I think the, the history of patients with PNH is that they've done generally pretty well, but they but some have had infectious mm -hmm. complications. Uh, our experience has only been a couple of years now. A few, actually, it's getting up to a few years now, and we haven't seen a lot of major problems. In general, the kids have done incredibly well because of their improved uh, anabolism and, uh, in general, they're healthy. You know, they're they're like have normal. Uh, growth and, and, and the immune system has come back. They're not spilling immunoglobins out. So generally, in terms of infections, they're doing much, much better. Uh, but it's always a worry because you've now taken away one part of their innate immune system. And if they get in the wrong circumstance, that could prove to be uh, critical. But they, they, they require drug generally about um, uh, once a month, uh, rarely uh, every two weeks. So if you stopped it, then the block to complement activation would presumably go away pretty pretty quickly. And what we've tried to do is taper it so that in people that seem to be doing well metabolically and not having the abdominal um, problems, we, we try to get them down to the lowest dose possible. 
And, and it's really interesting, just as a, a kind of a closing little story, that when you propose to one of these patients that we reduce the dose, they're like, no way. <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. Because it is such a dramatic effect on their health and their ability to eat and just basic stuff that we take for granted, getting up in the morning and not having you know, abdominal pain and, and vomiting, that they really are very reluctant, but we've managed to talk some of them into bumping it down a little bit. And, and you can do that on some of them and get it down a little bit lower than what would be the normal course for a PNH. So. Well, this is fantastic as it is. Uh, just looking at the clock on my laptop, it looks like we've got just 30 seconds to go. Uh, so <laughs> I guess I won't ask any more of the questions here, but uh, if, if there are burning questions from the audience, if they put them into the, uh, the proper uh, box on the on their screen. Uh, we'll see to it that uh, we get answers to them as well. Uh, this has just well, been great. great thank great you, talk. thank you for being such a great moderator, and thank, thank Wynn for this wonderful series that's been contributed so much to NIH uh, medicine. It has meant a huge amount to the NIH community over a, a number of years, and we are all very grateful. That's for sure. So anyway, with that. I think it's time to uh, blast off uh, and uh, do something else for the evening. But thank you all uh, very much for attending. You, and Mike, for Ellen, and Lynn, thank you for everything that you've done and for the colleagues who are in the black behind the screen who are actually making <laughs> all of this happening and making my hands go up and down with their, uh, their strength. So anyway, with that, uh, we'll call it to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay, have a good night.